Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is a case out of South Africa that is a truly heartbreaking case, but it can definitely be an eye-opener for a lot of us. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Darren, Alicia, Stacy, and Natasha for being a part of the Patreon family. I appreciate your support more than you know. From the bottom of my heart, thank you all so, so much for being with me through this crazy journey. It's because of you guys that I'm able to continue making the content that I love making and spreading awareness about these very important cases. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Karabo Mokwinwa. Karabo Mokwinwa was born on March 27th, 1995 to her parents Lorraine, who went by Lolo, and Maga Green Mokinwa, and she had a sister named Botley and a brother named Labogang. She was described as a strong, intelligent woman. She was a part-time business student at Regenesis School at the time of her death. She had also been living with her parents in Dekloof, South Africa at the time of her death. She was very close with her family, sharing a room with her little sister up until she was an adult. Botley describes that Karabo was outgoing, sociable, and loved interacting with people, while her little sister was more introverted and a homebody. Her and Botley had a six-year age gap, but that didn't stop them from having a special bond. Karabo took her role as a big sister very seriously, especially as they grew older. Botley knew that she could go to Karabo with anything, and the two became best friends. She was also described as being a kind, nurturing young woman. She would do anything to go out of her way and help anybody that needed it. Other friends of Karabo described that she was someone who connected with people's hearts. She had the complete package, beauty on the inside and out. She had so much compassion for others. She was a light and inspiration for those who knew her. But beyond that, she was a truly intelligent, confident woman who stood up for what she believed in. She was a strong believer of women and children's rights. She frequently volunteered at Frida Hartley's Women's Center, where she spoke to women in abusive relationships and encouraged them to leave their situations and trying to provide them with the resources that they needed. She also volunteered with children at the House Group Orphanage, the Hadassah Treatment Center for Women, and the Nazareth House. She was so passionate about helping women in need that it was her dream to create a charity nonprofit organization to help women in need. One reason that she was so passionate about the topic is because gender-based violence is a huge problem in Johannesburg and especially all over South Africa. One source states that as many as 28 to 37 percent of men in South Africa have admitted to raping a woman at some point in their life, and that's only the men who have admitted it. The prevalence of rape is as many as 28% of women reporting being raped at some point in their life, compared to the US, which also has a problem, but our statistic is about 14.8% of women, which is still far too high. 56% of women who were murdered in South Africa were murdered by their male partners, compared to 34% of women being murdered by their partners in the US. All of these statistics are very concerning, so it makes sense why Carabo was so passionate about the topic. Now, by October of 2016, while at Regenesis Business School, 22-year-old Carabo met a 29-year-old man named Sandile Manso. He grew up in a small town called Mibalinle and attended school in Secunda, just west of Johannesburg. At the time, Sandile was working as a forex trader for a company called Trillion Dollar Legacy in Johannesburg. Now, he did have three children. He had two children with his ex-wife and another with an ex-girlfriend. But while attending university, he was studying graphic design. When Carabo first met him, he seemed like a great guy. He was charming, kind, charismatic, and he was deeply religious. He loved the finer things in life, and he lived what some people described as a flashy lifestyle. He had a fleet of cars, which included his golden BMW, his limited edition Mercedes-Benz, and an Audi. He always posted videos to his YouTube channel about all of his cars. He posted videos about how he made money via trading and made some videos about how others can learn from him how to trade and make money like he does. He even offered classes for $400 a day where people could learn how he does what he does. Yeah, 
Hey, what's up, guys? Um, it's the boys from TDL Trillion Dollar Legacy. Oh yeah, of which? Petro Stevovo. What's up, TDL? Kabza. Guys, listen, man. Um, the forex market is so big. Hey, it's such a big, 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 big market. There is room for everybody, Buffy. There is room for everybody who knows what they are doing. Yes, there will be others who stand out than others. But at the end of the day, you know, we are about economic freedom. You know, we are fighting the economic struggle. Our parents fought, fought for the political struggle. I need. They fought to liberate us from uh, slavery. They fought to liberate us from political injustice and so forth. And now it's our time as young people at this time in age to use technology to fight the economic struggle. And one of the best tools to fight economic struggle is the forex market, Buffy. But now, as we are on this, man, anybody who's out there genuinely helping people make it in this market, we're on the same team. We might be trillion dollar, you might be what what, however, wherever, as long as you're doing something, a sharp, you are now. We ain't hating on no one. These days we've got so much shade on Vitu. Just because we're out there and we're doing it, you know, um, a lot of people are like, ah, hey, 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 hey. Listen, you can subscribe to TDL Signals. You can subscribe to anyone else's signals. The more the merry. At the end of the day, you'll be making money. If our signals help you make money, then be it. Then be it. If his signals help you make money, then be it. You're making money at the end of the day. That's, that, that's all. That's all. You're making money at the end of the day, and that's all. That's all we want. So, his confidence, his ability to connect with others, and his infectious personality is exactly what drew Carabo to him. She thought that he was a God-fearing man who was religious and had good morals. So pretty quickly after meeting, the two began a relationship. Now, Sandile would say that he loved Carabo's strong personality and her confidence. Carabo loved almost everything about Sandile. From the outside, the two seemed like a power couple. Carabo's mother, Lolo, described that she warned her daughter from the get-go not to ever bring home a boyfriend unless he is a God-fearing man. And after meeting Sandile, that is exactly what Carabo thought she had. She called her mother one day to let her know that she was bringing him over to meet them and asked that she be nice to him. When he came over and met the family for the first time, Lolo cooked for them. At the time, he seemed like a nice young man and they seemed to be a completely normal couple. After dating for only about a month, Carabo left the home where she lived with her family and moved in with Sandile into his luxury Santin Sky high-rise apartment. However, shortly after moving in with Sandile, Carabo realized that he was not the man that she thought he was. It was only about a month after moving in, by December of 2016, that Carabo started to tell her friends that Sandile was abusive. In the first incident that she told her friend about, she said that Sandile got upset because Carabo wouldn't allow him to have fingerprint access to her phone. So, he pushed her into a wall, strangled her, and smashed her phone. After the incident, she asked Sandile if he was going to replace the phone since he damaged it, but he refused to. The friend said that in another incident, Carabo told her friend that Sandile hadn't been home for a while, but when he returned home, he opened the bedroom door where Carabo was in the bedroom naked. He grabbed and flung her towards the glass table while she was still naked. I don't know the, you know, situation surrounding this, but it seemed that he was just out for a while came home, saw her, and was mad at her for whatever reason. The friend also reported another incident where her and Sandile had been traveling, and I guess the two got into an argument at some point while they were in the car. So, Sandile pushed her out of the car and left her by herself on the side of the road with her luggage and nowhere to go. Other friends said that they did witness him manhandling her in the car at one point, and after more time passed, the abuse that Carabo suffered just got worse and worse. He would insult her, hit her, and spit at her and disrespect her in any way that he could. She did start documenting the photos of her injuries, including bruises that she had sustained and a black eye. She told one friend that she was emotionally exhausted and frightened by the level of abuse that Sandile was already doing, so she had no idea what he was capable of. Then, about two months before her death, Carabo also opened up with her mother about the abuse. 
She would start sending her pictures of her abuse, showing her pictures of her bruises and her other injuries. Of course, Lola was concerned. She reported that she told her daughter, quote, Carabo, Sandile is going to kill you. You can't go on like this. This is not a toxic relationship. I don't know what to call this. By the early morning hours of March 27th, 2017, so Carabo's birthday, her friends and family started reaching out to her to wish her a happy birthday, but she wasn't responding. However, her mother soon received a call notifying her that Carabo was actually at Morningside Hospital. It turned out that Sandile had actually smashed and broke Carabo's phone once again. So she was finally able to call her mother from the hospital and she explained what happened. She said that Sandile beat her so badly that she was in the hospital, but he isn't even the one that took her to the hospital because he was afraid of being arrested. When speaking about this phone call, Lolo said, quote, I cried at work. I said, but why Carabo? She said, Mama, Sandile just threw me in the hospital and left me with a card. He also broke my phone and bought me a new one. Of course, Lolo and McGregorine urged their daughter to report this to the police and to get a protection order against him. To this, Lolo reports that Carabo said, Mommy, it is not going to do any good to me. Why must I do that? This guy is evil. You know that. He doesn't care and I know he's probably planning something for me. But after some convincing, she did end up reporting the assault to the police. So she went to the police station, but when she went there to make the report, she found out that Sandile had already been there that morning. He already filed a report against Carabo saying that she assaulted him. So I guess there was this other incident where Carabo told a friend that Sandile had been robbed in a different town and during that he was assaulted. She said that about two days after this assault from the robbery, he assaulted her and I believe this is the one that ended up with her in the hospital. But while doing so, I guess he fell down and like mildly injured himself. I also saw that while he was hitting Carabo, she fell and landed on his car and dented it a little bit. Either way, she said that after this, that is when Sandile went to the police station and reported that she was actually the one who assaulted him and damaged his car. In one texting conversation, she told a friend about how emotionally exhausted she was because of all of this. The conversation reads, quote, Carabo, my heart, I'm hurt. I don't even have the energy to go on or face the case. The friend, Carabo, this person was killing you. Carabo, he really was, and he is not apologetic. He opened a case against me too. Carabo, physically, I am okay, but mentally and emotionally, I am so broken. With this, she also sent a voice message to her friend to explain the situation, explaining that he assaulted her. So after all of this, after the assault, after she ended up in the hospital, she finally decided to let go of Sandile. She broke up with him and moved out of his apartment and moved back in with her parents. About two weeks after the incident, the police just dropped the charges against the both of them. The police shrugged the charges off as a fight between a couple and told the couple to work it out. Of course, Carabo complained because when she reported the assault, she had clearly been viciously beaten. She ended up in the hospital. Sandile, on the other hand, he barely had a scratch on him. But police said that they didn't have the time to investigate fights between lovers. So that's what they took this as, just a fight between lovers, not domestic violence, not a vicious attack, just a lover's quarrel. So also about two weeks after the assault, Carabo went out with a few of her girlfriends and her sister at a nightclub in Santin. The girls had gotten some drinks and were enjoying their night when Carabo spotted Sandile. He had also been there for a night out with his own friends. After seeing him, Carabo called her mother to let her know that she saw him and Lolo told Carabo to leave him alone. Her friend said much of the same, advising her to just not even acknowledge him, to just leave the nightclub and leave him alone. But that isn't what happened. She went up to him and the two started chatting again. That night, the two talked for quite some time and they reconnected. After this, the two started talking again. In the days after this, Carabo complained to a friend that Sandile never apologized for beating her so badly that she ended up in the hospital. She also said that he was openly talking about other women that he was talking to. 
She didn't move back in with Sandy Lay or anything, but the two were a couple again, despite these other behaviors. Nonetheless, on the evening of April 26, 2017, Carabo told her mother that she was going to be going out for the night with Sandy Lay and possibly staying the night with him at his apartment. That night, Lolo called Carabo to check in on her. Carabo answered, but she was speaking in a hushed tone on the phone, saying that she couldn't talk at that time and would call her back later. So, as time went on with them being out at the bars, and I guess they went clubbing together and drinking together and things like that, the two were seen getting into a heated argument, which turned into a physical fight. The two seemed to calm down a bit after this, but they did storm out of the club together. So, the two went out on the 26th. Obviously, they stayed out all night until the 27th. So, the following day after that, on April 28th, Lolo noticed that she hadn't heard from Carabo in quite a while. Carabo never called her back like she promised, so Lolo was starting to get worried. She tried calling and texting her, but it was all going unanswered. So, Lolo decided to call Sandile to ask him if he knew where Carabo was, but he said he didn't. According to Lolo, Sandile seemed surprised to hear from Lolo, but he was acting calm and normal during this phone call. He told Lolo that she was at his apartment that night, but that she left the previous day and he hasn't seen her since. As hours passed without hearing from Carabo, Botley decided to go herself to the Sky apartment building to look for her sister. She asked the apartment staff if they had seen her at all, but they said that they hadn't. But they did say that they found something that was weird. The apartment staff told Botley that the cleaning staff had found Carabo's ID and her passport placed in trash bins on the fourth floor of the apartment building. Now, immediately after she went missing, Carabo's parents tried filing her as a missing person, but I guess they weren't able to for whatever reason. It's said that the reason for the difficulty is unknown, but either way, by April 30th, they were finally able to report her as a missing person. After filing her as a missing person, Carabo's friends and family set out to find her. They started a massive social media campaign about her disappearance, and police started their investigation. When they questioned Sandy Lay, he initially said that he didn't know where Carabo was. He said that she left his apartment and just didn't come back. Then he noted that maybe she went to London, but as we know, that isn't possible because her passport was found in a trash bin. Now, when police questioned Sandile, Lolo had also been at the police station waiting in the lobby to hear answers. And after a long wait, a police officer came out to notify Lolo that Sandile had actually just confessed that her 22-year-old daughter, Carabo, was dead. When Sandile initially said this, he told a few different versions of events as to how he died. In one story, he said that he left his apartment that night and came back to find that she was dead. He said that after finding her, he went to his garage to get a petrol container, and then he went to a petrol station to fill the container. He then said that he took her body in his car and then went to his mother's house in Bramley to get some pool acid. Then he said he dumped her body in a ditch. He said that he placed a tire around her neck and then covered her body in pool acid. Then he poured the petrol all over the tire and set fire to it. However, it turned out that the days after Carabo went missing, by April 29th, witnesses in a neighboring jurisdiction reported saying what they thought was a burning mannequin in a field. Witnesses said that they couldn't even tell what was burning, that they just saw something up in flames. That is how badly this body had been damaged. When police arrived, they knew what they found had been a burning body, but at first, they couldn't identify the body, again, because it was very badly damaged. But they were soon notified about the confession that the other police station had gotten, and they sort of connected the dots. About 10 days after the body was found, DNA confirmed that the burned, charred, horribly damaged body was that of 22-year-old Carabo. Of course, after this discovery, Sandile was arrested and charged with Carabo's murder, but he continued to maintain that he did not murder Carabo. He first said that somebody else had murdered her. He would go on to say that he knew that she had been cheating on him the entire three-month relationship with other men from Nigeria. 
As a side note, this is also the reason that he had given for why he beat Karabo too, because he really was convinced that the entire time that they were together, that Karabo was cheating on him with multiple other men. But either way, he first said that she was killed by someone else in his apartment, and that that is when he came back up to the apartment and found her dead. Then in his next story, he told the police that she wasn't actually killed, that she took her own life, that she died by suicide. He even went on to say that she tried taking her own life before, but him and a security guard at the apartment complex had to stop her. But when the security guard was later questioned about this, he said that he had no idea what Sandy Lee was talking about. Through these two stories though, he maintained that he knew that he was going to be blamed for her death even though he wasn't the one that caused it. He said that he knew that the charges against him with him beating Carabo looked really bad. So he said that he knew if he told anybody about her death, that it would be blamed on him, and that is why he decided to move her body and burn her rather than calling the authorities to report it. Then, in yet another story, Sandile told investigators that she wasn't murdered and that she didn't just die by suicide because she was mentally ill. Now, this time, she actually sacrificed herself to break a curse that had been placed on the both of them. Sandile said that in the months before her death, Carabo introduced him to someone that she called Master. Together, they participated in blood rituals that would bond them together for life. The bonding was supposed to bring them great financial success, but he said that because of this blood ritual, if they ever broke up, that a curse would be placed on the both of them. And the only way to break the curse was for one of them to die. So she decided to take her own life to sacrifice herself to break the curse. Sandile said that when Carabo came over that day, he left her alone in the apartment and went downstairs to get a trash bin. But while he was gone, that is when she killed herself by cutting her throat with a knife. He said that when he came back up with the trash bin, he just happened to have it with him. He grabbed it for a different reason, but you know, he found her dead. So he said that he put her body in the trash bin and then took the bin back down to the garage. Now, as police went on with their investigation, they found CCTV footage from Sandile's apartment complex. So the security footage captured them arriving at his apartment. We can see them entering the apartment lobby at around 2.48 a.m. on the 27th. While on the video, we can see that Carabo, in my opinion, does look a little bit upset. She looks annoyed or tired, and her and Sandile are not speaking to one another. They barely even look at one another. Now, this next bit of footage is not available to the public, but investigators say that at around 6 p.m. on the 28th, he is seen by himself leaving his apartment and then getting off of the elevator, then he is seen going back to his apartment just four minutes later. It was around that time that Sandile says that Carabo took her own life. However, of course, police did not believe that within this small four-minute period that she would have killed herself. Of course, it could be possible that the second he left, she just went for it and he came back up and found her, but it just does not seem all that likely. Then security camera footage shows that on the next day by April 28th by 10 a.m., Sandile is seen getting off of the elevator, rolling a trash bin behind him, and then he is seen leaving the apartment. As we know from what Sandile said himself, Carabo is in that trash bin at that time. Then we see on security footage that Sandile leaves his apartment complex in his gold BMW. I don't think there was ever footage captured of Sandile transporting Carabo's body to the car from the trash bin, but I'm sure if there was, it would have been reported, so I don't think there was. Either way, we know at that time that Carabo's body was in that car. Then later, he's seen returning to his building just past midnight, now going into April 29th. We see that he's wearing latex gloves and carrying a trash bag. The trash bag does look full of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily look heavy. We can also see him throw that trash bag away in bins on the fourth floor once again, and then leaves with his latex gloves still on. Then when Carapo's body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy, they were not able to determine a cause of death because of how badly her body had been burned. 
but there was also a police officer who had seen her body who said that the ritual theory doesn't seem too far off. This officer said that Carabo was actually missing several of her organs. Some sources say that she was missing her heart as well as 60% of her other organs. So the theory here is that Sindile had removed her organs in some sort of ritual. But a lot of people don't agree with this. In one podcast I listened to about this case, the True Crime South Africa podcast, the host talks about how she accidentally stumbled across the photos of Carabo's body when she was found. I didn't see the photos and I don't really want to, so I'm not gonna go out of my way to find them, but the host described that the tire around Carabo's neck was almost incinerated. Her face was almost completely destroyed. The skin and other tissue surrounding the tire, such as her neck and her chest, was pretty much melted away and obliterated. So it's hard to say, but a lot of people don't think that this was a ritualistic killing. A lot of people believe that it only appears that way because of how badly her body was burned. So we don't know for sure if this fire and the pool acid and the petrol was enough for her organs to basically melt to the point that it looked like they weren't there, but some people believe that that is the explanation because again, the tire was around her neck, her heart is right next to the tire, and that is the main source of the fire. So a lot of people believe that that's actually why she didn't have her heart and some of her other organs. It's also said that it's not sure whether or not she was dead at the time that her body was set on fire. Sandile said that she was, but she could have just been unconscious. It's impossible to say because we don't know her exact cause of death, but if she was still alive at that point, that is absolutely horrific and I it's hard to even think about and imagine that because of how horrifying that must have been for her. After hearing all of this evidence, of course, he was charged with premeditated murder. Then, in light of the murder, he was then charged with the assault with intent on causing grievous bodily harm from the assault that was reported two weeks before her death. After the initial charges, the trial was delayed and delayed time and time again. Sandile tried anything he could to stall and stall the trial and make Carabo look as badly as possible. As I said from before, he continued to say that Carabo had been cheating on him with multiple partners. He said that Carabo was often violent towards him and often physically assaulted him. Then he tried saying that Carabo became addicted to the high life that other men provided. He said that another partner was paying her 100,000 rand, which is around 5,500 US dollars per month, and that made her addicted to living an expensive lifestyle. Then he said that Carabo had been sexually assaulted by one of her other past partners, and that made her become depressed and very violent towards him. He also tried saying at one point that Carabo's father had been physically abusive towards her. He actually tried saying that McGregorine was actually the one who assaulted her, giving her that black eye and causing her to go to the hospital. He said that Carabo opted to stay with a friend after the hospital stay because she was so scared to go back to the house that she shared with her parents. He even said that there was one time that she tried killing herself by cutting herself, saying that her sister even witnessed her cutting herself. Then at one point, he said that he found her passed out on the floor next to a box of sleeping pills. He also tried saying that he was trying to inspire her to become a better person. He said that he was trying to act as a good influence in her life. He said that he tried helping her set up her nonprofit that she always wanted to start. He said that he did his best to help her live out her dreams and be the best influence to her as he possibly could. He said that the only thing that he can be blamed for is for not being there the last moment when she finally collapsed. So basically, he was doing whatever he possibly could to make Carabo look as bad as possible. All of these things that he was saying, though, were completely different from what others had to say about her. The trial for murder started on March 12th, 2018. A lot of the evidence that they presented was what we discussed earlier. But in addition to that, 
several people close to Carabo testified about the relationship between her and Sandile. Her mom said that after meeting Sandile, she knew that he was a bad presence in her life. She tried getting her to leave him many times throughout the relationship because from the beginning, before she even knew for sure about the abuse, she kind of just had a feeling that he was bad news. Her brother said much of the same. Her brother said that he's one of the people that really convinced her to file that police report against him for the assaults. Her sister talked about how Carabo was never violent and neither was their father. She called her father a strict man who expected his children to follow certain rules, but he was always loving and never aggressive towards Carabo or any of his other children. Everyone who knew Carabo completely went against what Sandile was saying about her. She was a loving, confident woman. She wasn't violent. She wasn't suicidal. The only mistake that she made was staying in a relationship with a man who abused her. So at the end of his trial on May 3rd, 2018, the court made their decision. They found Sandile guilty on all charges, including the murder and assault, and they sentenced him to 32 years behind bars. At the sentencing hearing where Sandile testified that he was remorseful, the judge presiding over the case said, quote, the court cannot come to any other conclusion other than that this remorse is self-pity. You are more concerned that you have been caught. He went on to say, the court got the impression that you were claiming to be the victim without any regard to the deceased. You have had no regard for the deceased, the family, or the friends of the deceased. Your actions cannot be described in any nicer terms. We are constantly being reminded that violence against women has no place in this country. Despite these warnings, these offenses are prevalent in this area. Despite harsher sentences, the offenses are on the increase. He then addressed Carabo's murder. The judge said, quote, This court would like to describe it as a crime of no return. The deceased had a constitutional right to life, and you had no right to depossess her of her life. A person's life is the most important asset that person has. If a person loses his life, he has nothing. In this case, the deceased has nothing, thanks to you. You have taken her life from her and have nonchalantly carried on with your life as if nothing was wrong. The court cannot describe you in any other way than a devil in disguise. The judge explained that his lack of concern for Carabo's family and their worry is just cold-hearted. The fact that he knew what happened to her while her family were calling him and asking for answers. The judge went on to acknowledge the problem that the country has with violence against women. He said, quote, In sentencing you, the intention is to serve as a warning to others that this type of conduct, the abuse towards women, will not be tolerated in society. She died for the rights of abused women. Abused women have to be protected against abuse from men like you. It would be appropriate to call you a person that gives men a bad name. You deserve nothing less than a harsh punishment. Taking life comes with a high price, and now you have to pay a high price. You will now be an outcast in the community. Uh, the court cannot describe you in any other way than a devil in the sky. She did not deserve to perish at your hands in the way that she did. Your cold-heartedness towards the deceased is evident from your conduct after you killed her. You went on with your life as if nothing was wrong and nothing happened. The cause of a death uh, could not post-mortem be established and it was left to the court to make such a finding. In sentencing you, the intention is not only to punish you for what you had done, but also to serve as a warning to others that this type of conduct, and I'm stressing abuse, abuse of conduct toward women, will not be tolerated in our society. As far as the interest of society is concerned, no sentence that the court will impose today will bring back the deceased to life. She is now gone forever, thanks to you. The memory will still live on, however. Yes. While sentencing an offender, the court must make it clear that the to the community that their interests are also important. And the community has a right to know that she did not die in vain. It would not be inappropriate to uh, call you a person that gives men a bad name. One looks at your actions before and, and afterwards. Uh, the court has no 
doubt that you are a danger to society. Okay. Uh, you've shown no remorse at all. Even in evidence today, you try to avoid responsibility. You deserve nothing, nothing less than a harsh punishment. No other sentence than imprisonment would be appropriate. You caused an imbalance in the scale of justice, and that imbalance must now be corrected by imposing an appropriate sentence. To take a life comes at a high price. The court has no doubt that you will now, from now on, be an outcast in the community. The court is of the opinion that the following would be an appropriate sentence. For the assault charge, you are sentenced to five years in prison. For murder, you are sentenced to 30 years in prison. <laughs> For the attempt to defeat or obstruct the course of justice, you are sentenced to four years in prison. In the interest of mercy, the court orders that two years of the five years on count one and four years on count three run concurrently with a sentence on count two. The effective sentence is therefore 32 years in prison. It is really nice to see a judge playing absolutely no games when it comes to gender violence. It's nice seeing him taking it seriously and at least trying to do what he can to try to prevent this from continuing. This overall case is just a really sad yet eye-opening one. The fact that Carabo was so passionate about helping other women. The fact that she spoke with other women about leaving abusive situations only to be subjected to it herself. The fact that she stayed with him, the fact that she made excuses for him throughout the abuse, it just goes to show that it can happen to anybody and truly, when it does happen to you, it's different. You can be someone on the outside looking in and think, why does she stay? It's so easy to leave. She did have a supportive family who loved her. She wasn't relying on him financially. She was motivated. She was driven. She was doing amazing things with her own life yet this still happened to her. This goes without saying, but I obviously think I know that he murdered her. I think he probably stabbed her in the neck because when you lie about something, there is always a bit of truth behind it. Him saying that she killed herself by cutting her own neck, I think that's admitting that he's the one who stabbed her in the neck and that is how she died because he probably doesn't know what an autopsy can find. He probably burned her body for that specific reason so that they wouldn't see her injuries, but who knows? He could have thought that they were going to find out anyways, so that's why he said that, but no matter why he said that she stabbed herself in the neck or cut herself in the neck, I think that is really how she died, but I think obviously that he's the one that cut her throat. I think that this was caused by another situation of her not wanting to be with him anymore, Maybe they got into a fight at his apartment or maybe this was because of the fight that they had at the bar. Either way, I think she probably made it clear at some point that she was not going to be staying with him and he decided not only that if he can't have her, that no one can, but that no one would ever see her ever again. He didn't just want her dead. He wanted her destroyed and I think that that is why he burned her body for two reasons because he didn't want people to see the injuries that she had, but also so that he could completely destroy any memory that anybody could possibly have of her in her last moments. There's genuinely no other reason if you're going to just admit that she killed herself by cutting her throat anyways. That doesn't make any sense, but I do think that that is why, in part, why he burned her body. In the aftermath of Carabo's murder, her family has started a nonprofit for her like she has always dreamed of doing herself. It's called the Carabo Moquinua Foundation and it aims to help support women, especially women who have been victimized. I will link any resources that I can for the foundation down below. But either way, that is all I have for today's case and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you think that this murder was truly for some sort of weird ritual or do you think it was just domestic violence that ended up in him murdering her? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out in any of my future videos. 
make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.